Good afternoon, everyone, and good morning, as the case may be, and welcome to this very special event, Abed Akwane Chats, then, now, next. This is our second online conversation in conjunction with the exhibition Abed Akwane, Continuous Fire, Feu Continuel. My name is David Galanders. I'm an educator in the Department of Education and Public Programs here at the National Gallery. Before we begin, I want to take just a moment to acknowledge that the National Gallery of Canada resides on the ancestral, unceded land of the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation, who have lived with and cared for it since time immemorial. As a settler person, I want to say that the land acknowledgements that I make in my role at the National Gallery are important to me, apart from the fact that they're important to the gallery. Personally, I take them to be um, a small step possibly, but a meaningful step for me on the path of reconciliation. Today's event will take place in English with French simultaneous interpretation. The French audio stream is available via the interpretation button along the bottom of the Zoom window. Thank you today to the simultaneous interpretation team for their work. Now, I'll very quickly introduce our hosts and our guests. Hosting today's event are Greg Hill, National Gallery of Canada Odain Senior Curator of Indigenous Art, Christine Lalonde, National Gallery of Canada Associate Curator of, in, of Indigenous Art, and both Greg and Christine uh, were uh, our co-curators of the Abidakwane exhibition, and Jamie Morse, the National Gallery's Indigenous Programs and Outreach Educator. Hi, Jamie. Uh, Greg is of Ganyangahaga and French ancestry and is a member of the Six Nations of the Grand River Territory. Christine is settler Canadian and Jamie is Michif, originally from Lac Biche, Alberta. Our guests today are Dempsey Bob, Dempsey is a Taltan Clinket artist born at Telegraph Creek on the Stikeen River and is a member of the Wolf Clan. Dempsey joins us today from Terrace, BC. Gwai Edenshaw is a Haida artist and filmmaker. His 2018 film, Sa'au Wai Khuna, I did my best, Gwai, uh, Edge of the Knife, made along with Helen Haig Brown, was screened on November 21st, 2019 as part of the Abedakwane exhibition. Carla Taunton is an Associate Professor of Historical and Critical Studies at the Nova Scotia College of Art and Design. She was a consulting curator for, the, for performance art for the Abedakwane uh, show, as well as a contributing author to the exhibition catalogue. Carla is white settler and joins us today from Halifax. Jason Edward Lewis is the Concordia University Research Chair in Computational Media and the Indigenous Future Imaginary and a co-director of Ab Aboriginal Territories in Cyberspace, or ABTEC. He was an advisor for the Abedakwane exhibition, as well as a contributing author to the exhibition catalog. Jason is Hawaiian and Samoan and joins us today from Montreal. After today's conversation, we will take some time for a period of questions and answers with you, the audience. Please submit your questions via the Q&A button along the bottom of the Zoom window. Um, I'll collect them and transmit them to the hosts and panelists during the Q&A period. We'll try to keep about 10 minutes at the end of the event for questions and answers. Um, it's a little bit after one o'clock Ottawa time and the event goes for about an hour. So um, at around 10 to two hour time, uh, I will try to find a convenient spot to jump in and say we've got some questions from the audience. Uh, questions, by the way, are welcome in both French and English. So now, without any further ado, I'm going to pass it along to Christine. Thank you, David. Uh, hello, everyone, uh, both those who are here in what I don't know what else to call it, but the Zoom room and um, everyone else joining us from their various parts of this land. Um, I'm here 60 kilometers outside of Ottawa, but still on the very expansive territory of the Algonquin Nation. This is the uh, second Abedakwane chat uh, as we continue to experiment like people are doing worldwide to see to what extent technology can help us uh, stay connected sort of the silver lining of the global pandemic has been um, these platforms that have arisen and we're all becoming familiar with and uh, perhaps they will in the long term mean a difference in the way that we can um, still have that sense of gathering and an important exchange. The idea behind our conversation today is then now next, um, Abadakwane Continuous Fire Feu Continuel has closed uh, October 4th after being extended two times. Uh, so now is a good moment to pause and look back and share our 
impressions, what it accomplished, what would be good for um, you know the next one. Um, and of course, the excitement now is the catalog release. Um, it's I've always loved saying this, hot off the press. I actually got my copy this morning. And there's the magnificent uh, cover where Lakaluk Williamson uh, Bathory lends us her uh, fierce creative uh, energy. And this is an image from the performance, Ikumagiya uh, Lit, Those Who Need Fire, with collective members, um, Chris Dirksen, Jamie Griffith, and Christine Tutu. And uh, so I just, first of all, like to say congratulations to all the artists, to all the authors, uh, to everyone involved. Um, it was a very unusual way to create the catalog and um, a lot of hard work has gone in to make it this beautiful, beautiful gem. I am gonna give you a, a little bit of a sneak peek of a few pages. <laughs> the first actually, just uh, we we'll start. So at the very first page we start is the text uh, from the Elders Language Committee of the Anishinaabeg Anishinaabeg uh, Algonquin, um, sorry, Kitigan Zibi community, who um, worked with us to gift us the title Abadakwane and who also um, worked with us to um, give us their permission for the cover catalog. So they were very involved in that and we're grateful for their guidance and help. Um, another page I don't want you to miss when you have a, your copy in hand is uh, this one, <laughs> which is the credit page um, that lists our uh, incredible publication team who um, worked in, uh, again, as in a very uh, unusual way over um, unexpected, unprecedented hurdles to bring this out to us today. And um, we could not overlook, of course, our co-curator, uh, Rachel um, Dickinson, who's not uh, part of our conversation today, but was um, an immense vital uh, part of the exhibition. And the catalog is really uh, richer and for her intelligent contribution and um, she brought uh, all of our thoughts to a higher level of refinement. Um, so I really want to extend the congratulations to Rochelle as well. Um, that's now, um, but of course, uh, even as the exhibition uh, has closed and the catalog is released, it's not, we wanna talk about what comes next, uh, but it's not uh, in a sense of um, then, now and next as being separate things. In fact, they're uh, inextricably bound together. And uh, I know that uh, everyone will have very much to contribute and I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts. Uh, so let's begin, um, pass it over to you, Jamie. <laughs> hey, hi everyone. I'm really happy to be here too, um, just because it's been, you know, kind of a, an interesting go with, the, with this um, exhibition. It's been so different than, um, the first, you know, Sakahan uh, that I was involved in and Abadakwane really opened up my eyes to um, just more knowledge about Indigenous people worldwide. And um, one of the things that I just, you know, find really fascinating is you, we have Sakahan, which means to ignite. So, you know, we were igniting that conversation in a really big way. And then with Abadakwane, it's to continue the uh, continue the, the fire. And so, um, yeah, and I was just thinking about how um, Dempsey, when you came uh, for the opening and um, when you were able to talk about your piece, you know, I think um, a lot of people were able to, to just like have access to a lot of the artists. And I think that was, 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 was really, um, for so many artists to be in the show, it was it was really kind of neat. And so to have this kind of you know one on one, it's 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 great. So I'm just going to open the questions to you, Dempsey. Um, you know what what um, the, looking back when you were there for the opening and when you were there for 
um, some of our programming. Um, what are some of your thoughts about the about the exhibition? Get to unmute though. Oops. You're muted still, Dempsey. He's going to be well practiced once he gets the unmute button about what he's going to say. <laughs> I think we've all done that a few times. So, um, so I guess um, just while they're figuring out the mute um, button, um, one of the, I know it was really great um, for Oh, you got it? Okay, yeah, I'm on. Now. Oh, okay. Hey, Sorry. I'm gonna mute I, mine now. I just wanna I just wanna acknowledge that I'm on the Simpsian territory of Kitzlas and Kalem. Um you know the best thing I, I experienced was you know meeting the Ainu from Japan and some of their their stories and history is very close to ours. And one of their salmon ceremonies is exactly the same. And they have clans like us and they carve different, but they understand us. And so, you know, like meeting them and meeting the Maoris again and working with them, like is it was such an incredible like experience for me, you know, because their cultures are so similar but different. And by working with different artists from all over the world made me see my art different. Mm -hmm. Because what happens when you live in your culture, you know it, so you take it for granted and you, you know what to do. Like, you know, with our protocols and our traditions. And, but when you, when you work with some other people that have a different tradition, you see how they work. And it makes you understand your own culture way better in your art too. Mm -hmm. And me, like working with different artists from, from like with the Maoris made me see my culture different. And what happened was they, they challenged me as an artist to get better, to become better artists and better people, better human beings. <laughs> mm. Because I think now today what we need is is return to our cultures because culture is what makes us who we are. It makes us Tlingit, makes us Talta, makes us Haida, makes us Simsian. Because culture is the glue, it's a spiritual glue of societies. And when you lose your culture, everything is meaningless. That's why the art is so, so important now and seeing the art from all over the world because art is what makes us human. Art is what makes us clink it. Art is what gives meaning to us because what art does for, for our people, it brings life into our culture. Also art, like when you put up a new building, it's just a box. Art is what brings life into that box. And I think that, you know, like with culture and art, it's very important because otherwise you lose your way. And I, I realize now that, you know, working with these people has really changed the way I think and the way I see because the art, you know, seeing all the different art forms, it really affects you. And myself, like a, as an artist, I realize that you only see what you really know. And if you don't know it, you don't see it. And it don't wait for you too. Yeah. And that's how good ideas are too. Good ideas, they don't wait for you. If you're not ready, you know, when a good idea comes, 
you must be working <laughs> because otherwise it's going to pass you by and next time it won't even look at you mm. so that's why it's important like like i met some really good friends there and really good people and that's what it's all about mm. i made me more proud and you know like to to work at that level and to to share makes all of us stronger as human beings mm -hmm. and that's what art does art makes us human and that's why it's important it's, that's why it's important to respect the art from all over the world because that belongs to them mm -hmm. and culture is 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 not just art it's how you live it's what you do if you don't do nothing that's your culture mm -hmm. and i find that by working with my people and teaching i was very lucky to find some very good people and i have friends like all over the world now and it affects me and it, it helps me in my own work mm -hmm. and i just like to thank the people of the national gallery because this opportunity to show the work from all over the world it's incredible it's incredible and it's yeah, a very good thing i want to thank you oh thanks thanks i'm going to take i'm going to take the thanks for on behalf of all of the gallery too and you know we actually had our own kind of personal growth as an institution during this time and um like the exhibition i i find really um like it it was it was good for us, you know, it was um, needed and it was uh, a way to even bring our staff together a like closer. We were working with, you know, everybody and um, having, you know, the artists come at the opening too. I'm going back to the opening. It was just like fantastic because we could see everybody's, you know, hard work kind of come together and then meeting. Um, everybody from around the world. I feel like this is, we're really lucky, whoever's on the Zoom call, because what you said is just so rich and I'm trying not to like take notes because I know this is recorded. <laughs> so I just have to remember what you said. Um, so what do you think is, you know, I think for, for next, you know, what's next? I mean, it's so um, uncertain in so many ways, but, you know, when you talked about having your culture and that's everything and art, you know, makes us human. Um, I, I think it's going to be an interesting artistic time in the next little while. What do, what do you think? I'll open the, I'll open the question up as well to, um, to, to, to Gwai as well. I think, you know, like, like we're in a, we're in a, it's in a funny time, but that's when art is created. <laughs> because art comes from struggle and hard work and, and chaos too, and, and, and making people wake up. Like what I found with this pandemic, I slowed right down. I had to stay home and had to do my work. And it gave me time to do my work. And it, it, it made me see it. Wow. I think what it did was give me my focus back again in my work and where I want to go and what I want to do. Because sometimes in life you get so busy, you got no time. There's no time to really think about what you where you're going, what you're doing. Because you, you know, like I've realized that I've been so busy just doing my work and trying to get it all done. I ran through most of my life. <laughs> and how this gave me time to slow down and think about my work and think about think about myself and, and where I want to take my art and where I've gone. And because what happened to me was I learned all these things. Like I've been to Russia, I've been to, I've been to Europe 12 times and I've looked at art all over the world because art, if it's good, it's good. And if it's bad, it's bad. I don't look at the bad stuff, but I realized that you could learn from anything. And a true artist, if you stop if you stop learning, you stop being an artist. And that's what I realized. And, and, and you have to keep pushing. You have to keep going. And I've always wondered where would our art have gone if we didn't stop the carving? You know, if we weren't stopped, 
it would be way out there. And I want to go there and I got to go there. There's nowhere else to go. Because as a true artist, when you, you got to find your path and you got to go there by yourself and nobody can go with you. and Nobody can help you. You got to find the strength in yourself because there's nowhere else to go and everything's been done, so. Mm -hmm. Why? What's next for you? I read, we, I'm going, I jumped right into what's next for you and I, I should focus maybe on, on the now, on um, uh, what you're doing now. I saw a presentation that you did at the Canadian Museum of History and it had all these fascinating um, electronic, you know, digital parts with your carving and it was the coolest thing that I've ever seen, I swear. So is that some of the things that you're working on now? Uh, yeah, sorry, I, Jamie, I, I missed the very first part of the, the question. It, it just froze out for a second, but but um, yeah, me me and my little brother, Jolin, have been um, working, you know, just sort of, uh, making use of some of the resources that that we've got all around us and you know seeing um how we might uh challenge ourselves in that fashion so yeah we had uh you know there's a long tradition of puppetry particularly like in the secret societies and and uh so you know, we we just wanted to um, see if we if we tested ourselves to see what we could what we could use out of modernity. So, you know, uh, you seen the articulated uh, mask that was all uh, controlled by little robotic. Uh, controllers to open its mouth and blink its eyes and all that yeah. um, you know in some uh, some of these cases uh, that case in particular uh, what we learned was actually that the old way was superior uh, you know that that was a very fun and challenging uh, project but fitting all those mechanics in behind the mask left no room for a human. Uh, I'm still, uh, I've got plans for how to, to evolve that, but in the, in the short term, you know, it's an unwearable mask. I think it might be a, uh, you know, maybe a vanquished enemy on the top of a pole or something. Uh, but, uh, we we another fun one uh, that we did that you seen was uh, we projected onto a blank mask so yeah. we we could uh, make this transformation mask and and that one surpassed my expectations because uh, you know the substrate was was one mask and I thought that it would probably always still be that mask but the transformation was pretty complete and 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 you know the places that we could take that mask uh seem pretty limitless um uh my brother did a mask uh that he's been uh planning on doing for probably almost 20 years, uh, probably longer than that. Um, when, but when we were in uh, Oxford, we found a mask that had little platforms for, for uh, coals or candles or something like that behind the eyes and then uh, wow. leather <laughs> painted red in front of it. So that was a story that he had heard from Nani Nora about a about a supernatural who whose eyes would glow 
read at you. And so, um, you know, he is able to do that with light and remotely control it. And, you know, we played with uh, um, 3D technology. Um, um, I don't want to get into into the weeds of like all the things that we did, but uh, the other one was, uh, you know, in the in in a potlatch during the performances, you always if you're there trying to get a picture of the shot, what you usually see is, you know, up front a bunch of photographers. And then behind them, kind of a sea of cell phones being held up. And uh, so we housed our camera gear inside of a Raven mask so that we could get a photographer right up inside of the action past all the uh, cell phones and whatnot and, and really like get into the shots. Wow. Yeah, I think all that stuff, is like everything... The idea of transformation, um, you know, in the mask itself is it, and, and the and the being transforms. But I also like what you did with transforming your technique as well. <laughs> like you, you but um, when you were talking about those little uh, when you were talking about how some of the older, you know, technology was actually was actually better, I, I think it kind of goes back to, um, you know, what Dempsey was saying about always learning and, and just like, we think we can, we think we, we uh, you know, we think we know our culture in some ways and then we just learn more and more. So like I, I wore these earrings today as an example, I do fish scale art and I have a mentee and I would never have thought about putting fish scales as jewelry because that's not what we did, but she's, you know, a whole other generation and, a lot of people are wearing their culture and wearing their art now. And so to see what, you know, she's done with it is, is, is pretty neat, but. That's pretty yeah. cool. So those are fish scales. Yeah. Deadly. And a porcupine quills and birch bark. Huh. Yeah. That's Aaron Consmo. So yeah. Greg, did you want to, um, uh, did you want to, uh, um, talk? <laughs> I don't know what else to say. <laughs> Sorry. No, um, actually, I'm going to just hand it over to Christine because I think she's got a, a good question for Carla. Oh, OK. See, uh, you're not the only one, Dempsey Bob. <laughs> this is trouble. I'm un <laughs> unmuting. <laughs> Here I am. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you both for that. That's really amazing. And it, and it brings our conversation in a great direction. Um, uh, for Carla, I just wanted to say I really um, enjoyed and appreciated your essay in the, the catalog, uh, Embodied Resurgence, Global Indigenous Performance. Um, I think as a consultant curator um, for the performance part of it, that it's not a surprise perhaps that you really articulated all of the ideas behind um, a broader concept of performance um, to include uh, the making of um, art and objects. Uh, they're not separate things. Um, and then of course there were a very, a lot of uh, um, insightful observations that hadn't occurred to me before. So I really enjoyed being able to learn more too. For today, I wondered um, if you could, um, give us a little bit of maybe um, what was going through your mind as you were writing or what was the most important message that you hope to communicate to readers? And I'm gonna roll my one question into uh, thinking about what's next too. I'd really love to hear what you uh, have been thinking about in terms of how what is happening now is changing um, performance uh, practices. For sure. Thank you so much, Christine. Um, hello, everyone. It's so wonderful to be here today. I'm joining you from Chibuktuk, from uh, Mi'kma'ki, uh, the ancestral and unceded territories of the Mi'kmaq Nation, who are currently uh, exercising, demanding, um, igniting 
um, and continuing treaty and sovereignty rights uh, with fisheries. So just want to uh, make a statement of solidarity for, for the folks that are enduring um, settler colonialism today. Uh, so as for the essay, it's, it's really about continuities. I've had the um, real pleasure and, and uh, incredible opportunity as a researcher, as a white settler to think through um, unsettling um, art histories. And so that's a really important conversation for me and thinking through the, the actual operations of writing as a means to um, be in conversation with and thinking through indigenous sovereignty. So performance historically in our history has been placed in a certain category and it's an important conversation. But when you think through indigenous understandings of, of performativity, of making, um, like most things, they're interconnected. They're not classified. So in that essay, I really wanted to disrupt that practice of the classifications and that we really inherited from modern kind of academic and musicological and, and curatorial practices, which again have value, but to then tease them through and bring forward indigenous and decolonizing approaches whereby a maker, the hands of the maker is connected also to the gestural form, to an oral delivery of, of knowledge, and that all of this, whether it be a body-based performance, um, an oratory, or, or a making of making, create a living archive. And that the living archive is always being added to and nurtured by these practices. And that the past is always present um, within indigenous performance practices. So again, just really thinking through that absolute incredible dynamism of indigenous performance, both in the local context that we live in and work for and with communities, but also globally. And how in those contexts, despite uh, aggressive attempts by colonial governments, these practices continue. And so to think about that, that incredibleness of the new generations and the past generations and the current generations, um, working with performance-based practices to continue to contribute to that living archive uh, for the future generations to come. So those were some of the things that I was thinking about. I wanted to also give you know some some time for some of those earlier folks working like um, like Pauline Johnson um, and other who were working through performance practices in the 19th century um, and to think about them in the context of the National Gallery and I always think like what would it be like if if they were with us and I at the opening which was such a powerful um, experience to be at um, and I echo Jamie and and Dempsey and Gwai's conversations this morning. I actually think we all should have just sat and listened to Dempsey all morning. Um, <laughs> I know I could have, so thank you so much. Um, but just thinking about all of those folks walking through that entryway and how, how powerful that was and how that was an absolute assertion of Indigenous sovereignties, both a local conversation, but a global one. And so that was how I kind of ended my, my essay was to think about how all these artists coming together, that powerful act of gathering, which Dylan Minor talks about in his work, the elders say we don't visit anymore. Well, folks did that. And I, as a white settler, had the, you know, that privilege of being brought in and being able to be a guest. And hopefully I was a good one. Um, so those are some things that I was thinking about. And what was the second part, Christine, that you're asking me about? Oh, oh I just want to show you. I just want to show you that I have the teapot from Dylan's oh, performance so here. <laughs> I just thought of that. I didn't do that on purpose, I swear. <laughs> anyway. Thanks for bringing it up. Yeah, no, I, I love that work so much. Thank you for showing that. I, um, I mean, that concept, I think all of us in, in many ways, the way that we, it's beautiful, the way that we work, we try to, we try to visit, we try to gather. And obviously right now we can't. So this, this is our, our platform, our virtual gathering. Um, and that the idea of slowing things down a little bit that Dempsey was talking about, that importance where we can self-reflect and we can reconnect and we can think through where we're going. And for institutions like the National Gallery and all cultural institutions in Canada that have those, those legacies of, of colonization and systemic racism, this is a time for you and for myself as a white settler to reflect on those responsibilities. In the territories that I live in, it's a time for me to reflect on what does it mean to be a treaty person with the peace and friendship um, treaties from the 1700s? How do I embody that? And how do institutionally um, we do better? So I think for the National Gallery, this exhibition was outstanding. The leadership of, of all of you folks um, from the Indigenous office, I applaud you. And it was a real honor to be a consulting curator. So thank you again.
As for what's happening with performance now, I'm sure all of you have attended all kinds of online um, experiences. I really, um, I enjoyed Nuit Blanche, for example, which was supposed to have a lot of <laughs> like in-person ex um, experiences. Dr. Julie Nagam, I think did a incredible job of the pivot as we all have been saying a lot of, uh, which was VR. So kind of in your neighborhood where you could use your phone and experience a whole range of, of art, artists work from local to the Pacific, circumpolar artists as well. Um, I've also been paying attention to the National Arts Center and seeing some of the ways in which they've been incorporating conversation, dialogue. Um, I know there's been some exercise classes at one point in the summer that I actually <laughs> joined a couple of times on my mat leave. Um, yeah, and power so classes, power dance <laughs> classes too. It's great. Yeah, it's so great. I love it. And it does mean that for some folks who don't have um, ability to travel and, you know, so there's a we it's a weird thing. So it's like, it's a way to kind of create more accessibility and yet we can't be in person. So there's that kind of, there's like positives and drawbacks. Um, we recently, my collective GLAM collective, which is with Dr. Julie Nagam and Dr. Heather Goliarte, we had the opportunity to bring forward an installation at Nocturne, which is Halifax's night festival. Again, a lot of us wanted to bring in performance. Well, that's not COVID friendly. So we decided to wrap the um, really amazing Halifax Central Library, which is like a credible hub of of kind of almost like a community center now um, in Halifax. It's, it's an incredible space to wrap that um, with uh, indigenous pr uh, projections. So we're working with a lot of, of projections. We brought forward the work of Amrita Hepi from Australia. If you haven't seen her work, check it out. She's outstanding. Can you, can you imagine Gwai's like, I was just thinking when you were talking about that. <laughs> yeah, the yeah. projection of the mask on a building. Ooh, scary. But <laughs> and, and amazing. And again, that claiming of space. So. I think um, performance on, on the screen, is it the same? I don't know, but I've been watching a lot of performance artists doing um, like actual live performance uh, through artist run centers and galleries. And I think that I applaud them. Uh, and I, and I, I don't know how long we will be able to maintain that practice, but I think it's an opportunity for experimentation and an opportunity for some really incredible feedback because, of the, because I think some folks are more interested or more comfortable typing feedback or questions than necessarily engaging that way. So I'd like to see what, what happens in, you know, in, in the coming months. Um, but again, a lot of different practices of, of that virtual Zoom, <laughs> Zoom performance. I could keep talking, Christine, so you should probably cut me off. I, 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 <laughs> no, I, you know, one thing I've been questioning is why do we make these an hour? I, I, I really don't know where an hour came from as an adequate amount of time <laughs> to have a, a fulsome conversation. But um, oh, thanks, thanks very much, Carla. I think you're right. It's very interesting how the context, um, more people are able to uh, attend things than would have been possible. And I remember when, if you had to come in via the internet, it was seen as secondary. Um, now it's primary. Um, and what I'm feeling too, if anyone is like myself, a lot of the things I'm participating in are actually in the context of my family. So for example, watching some of the imaginative films this past uh, few days and into the weekend, uh, all of a sudden now, you know, a younger generation is looking over my shoulder at what I'm watching and interested. So that's, that's a sign, a good sign for the future. And maybe that's a great, uh, lead into Greg and Jason bringing us home with uh, what's a vision for the future, uh, imaginary futurism. Maybe before we get into the future, I think uh, Guire wanted to say something. Yeah. Well, I, I was just going to say that the, like, my, my experience with going into museums and, and looking at things, you know, it's, it's hard to replace that, that, uh, physical interaction with things, but, but the um, using video, using computers is just a different kind of tool. And there are um, ways that if you use it properly, like if you, if you take advantage of what that tool offers you, you know, the, the framing. So in a, in a stage performance, uh, Carla, um, you know, people can see to the edges of the stage when you can close off that 
that field of view, you know, it, you can you can play little tricks or you can do whatever. You just got to make use of the tool. And, uh, you know, so, you know, where I've where I've seen it stumble is when you're trying to just do the same thing on video it's 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 not as good but if you are trying to um to use the magic of 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 what we've got then you can create a totally different type of type of uh product thanks squad dempsey you're uh i muted did you have something that you wanted to add we can hear you, Dempsey. Or oh, you can I hear just, me. Okay. That as a sign. Yeah. Um, you know, like you talk about what's next, you know, because, um, you know, I've been thinking about my career and Frida and, and, you know, when we started, we had nowhere to sell our pieces. The galleries wouldn't accept it. The only place we could sell our pieces was at the totem pole gift shop in Prince Rupert and they ripped us off <laughs> and now we've gone from there you know in one lifetime to the National Gallery in a show like this you know what I mean like and we never thought we'd get there and I realized how important like uh, Frida was now you know because we were hanging on by a thread to our culture and, you know, like we come from, a, it's non-European, our culture. <laughs> I mean, you know, if you understand, if you understand the Northwest Coast, the Tlingit, the Haida Styles, it comes from here. It didn't come from Europe. And, and, and there's a whole way of thinking and, and uh, philosophy and also, you know, the history of it. And it's old, it's very, very old. And what I realized that like each generation validated that generation by the great art that was created for that generation with the meaning of the culture and the people. Because you can't separate the culture from the people, from the land. And the land is so important because when, wherever you live affects the way you are, if you know it or not. If you live in the city, all you see are blocks, cement, and pavement, and people. <laughs> and people wonder why I live in the north. I, I did my whole career from the north. Because I'm inspired here in the land, I'm close to the land and the animals. And that's what our ancestors were. And you know what, living here and working with Frida and teaching gave me time to mature as an artist and do my homework. You got to do your homework. And Frida sent us to Alaska to teach. And I wondered why for myself. And then what happened to me was I found my, my people up there. I found my family. I found my art. And I started dancing and singing. And so I got back to my culture and it was the best thing I ever did. And so teaching, I did my homework. I had to draw and draw and draw because when I started, I didn't want to draw. You know, I didn't want to draw and I didn't want to paint. I wanted to carve, but through drawing with the children, I learned how to draw because drawing is the is the foundation of our art because the better the drawing the better the carving the better the drawing the better the painting the better drawing forces you to see to really see and that's the key and you know what i think is next is um it's going to be different because I was lucky I grew up with elders that told me stories, told me the history. And I was born in the right family. My great grandfather was a carver from Alaska. His name was Judson Ward. 
And my great grandmother was a basket weaver. And my mother was an artist. My grandmother was an artist. So I was lucky. And I listened to them. But I wish I listened more now. But that's where I got my knowledge. And I, I studied it. And I, I worked and I worked. And that's how I did it. And I think what's next is going to be up to the young people like we're teaching at the school. It's their future. But they got to respect the culture and our traditions and our heritage. Because that's, that's our ancestors. Our ancestors were great, great artists, great sculptors, great painters, great designers. If you really understand traditional art, our ancestors were more contemporary than us. What my grandfather said that, look, you guys got all the fancy flashy tools, he said. You can't do what the ancestors did. He said they had no tools, but they still created everything. And if you understand our culture is so rich, like you talk about the performance, they had puppets, they had masks. We danced out our stories and this took days and days. They danced out the whole history of our clans and who we are, where we came from. It was all shown and it was real to the people. When you come in the longhouse, it was real to the children. So that's why it's important. And I think what's next is it's gonna be, it's gonna be different. And what I see is that our people are finally reclaiming our art and our culture and being proud of it again. Because we came a long ways and we came a long ways because of our teachers. And I think they're the ones that revive the art. And I thought about, you know, like how many, how many places I've been and how many things I've seen. And, and Frida was the one that gave me that spark uh, to be curious and look for these things. And we helped each other. And that's how we brought the art back. We share. And that's what makes us stronger. And that's what this thing is all about. It's the sharing of good things, good cultural values, and good art. That's what's important. Thank you. You always have to see. Um, I, I'm, I'm zooming in from. Uh from north of Ottawa, um, unceded, unsurrendered Algonquin territory. Um, and when I make this acknowledgement, I am also thinking about all kinds of terror that are currently with uh, Going to go hog get to so many people where there's sun. Um, but I, but I want to take us back into the future. Um, and and in that topic, uh, Jason Lewis has spent a, a lot of time thinking about the future. Uh, um, but also played a very important role. The exhibition uh, as an advisor, as a contributor to the catalog, as a, uh, a respondent to our ideas of discussant, uh, we could bounce off ideas off of like we did in the introduction. Um, but also, I think uh, he's made big contributions in other ways as an, as an artist, uh, as uh, it, all of his work uh, at Concordia. Um, as a mentor for many, many up and coming younger artists and thinkers as a scholar himself. Um, so, and all of that thinking about all that's work for the future. Um, and, and, and we talk about the future and imagining the future, his, uh, his projects imagining the future. In some sense, we're always in that position of having to imagine a future because it's not here yet. Um, but uh, what Jason is so like, given that the future 
is always in front of us in some ways. In some ways, it's part. It's, it is here, as, as you've talked about. Um, why is it so important to do the act of imagining the future? So, thanks for those kind words, Greg. Um, and thank you, everybody, uh, for 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 being here and for the National Gallery for inviting me to be part of this whole process. Um, I think it's important, you know, the a, a chunk of the <clears throat> futures work that we do, and when I say we, I mean my wife, uh, Skawanati, uh, is, um, you know, kind of came out of the workshops that we did, we were doing with Indigenous youth in the 2000s. Uh, she, you know, we were doing some work before, but it really got kind of turbocharged in those workshops, because in talking to them, we found that, um, that there was not a there wasn't necessarily a great set of future imaginaries that they had, right? That um, they, they, they didn't necessarily, not all of them, of course, but um, many, you know, didn't necessarily see such a bright future for themselves as individuals or for their communities. You know, we know, we know the reasons for that, right? We have an external culture that's, you know, trying to extinguish us all the time <laughs> um, and has a, a, a discourse and a rhetoric of us disappearing and we have all kinds of challenges within our communities, you know, that are that take a lot of energy and strength to to, you know, try to get through, just in the present. Um, and so there didn't seem to be a lot of room necessary for imagining what the future was like from a really indigenous, spec, uh, you know, position. And also, you know, there are lots of future imaginaries out there, imaginaries out there, Star Wars and Star Trek and everything else. Uh, but you know, those are Western. Those are Western future imaginaries and the history of science fiction is very much sort of intertwined with the history of colonialism and empire, right? And so, uh, you know, part of what we thought was, okay, so, and we love science fiction, right? So we thought, okay, well, you know, how can we take that, how can we create spaces that have that kind of freedom to think about what you want your culture to be like and, and get that conversation started from a Mohawk perspective or a Hawaiian perspective or Anishinaabe perspective or what, you know, whatever it might be. Um, because, you know, we, we, you know, I and me, me and Skawanati, I'll speak for at least in this case, you know, we're really interested in, in creating futures that, that respond to how, you know, our communities want to engage with the world, but we're surrounded by a larger society that, um, you know, imagines very different futures often. Um, and even when it imagines better futures, doesn't seem to be able to get there to sort of convince itself to take the necessary steps to get there in some ways. So we think it's, you know, I think it's important because it's a, it's a mindfulness exercise, right? It's a way of kind of taking a moment to really think through what you might like things to be like for your children or your grandchildren. And, you know, because most of the time I think we're we're in a state, I think one, we are constantly always imagining the future. That's how we sort of get through the day. That's how we imagine amazing artworks. And then like three months later, they actually exist in the world, right? It's how we create exhibitions like uh, like this one, right? That take years and years to, to, uh, to, to get underway. So we are always living in the future. It's very true. But part of what we wanted to do was really be like, okay, let's take the frame out let's actually take that frame, the frame out into the seventh generation, right? And kind of do some work that concretely imagines what that seventh generation might be like or what we want it to be like. And then working particularly with the indigenous youth we work with, like give them the, give them permission to do that uh, because it wasn't that they weren't capable, you know, and it wasn't, it's not that we're, you know, magicians, right? It's that, you know, that just seems like as indigenous people, we kind of off. We kind of need to give ourselves permissions to dream to, to dream of the future, because because the present is really challenging, and there's you know we need so much of our good minds devoted on on figuring out how to deal deal with the present challenges, and also we spend a lot of time thinking about our history, which is absolutely as it should be, right? But um, I, you know, thinking about how to tie all those things together. So going back to what Carla was talking about about continuity. Right. So how do you how do you create those future conversations? How do you frame them as a conversation about dis, about continuity? Right. Frame them as things that grow out of the past and grow out of our ancestors and stay grounded with them, even as we're doing crazy things like instrumenting masks and 
you know, projecting, you know, things on the side of buildings and dreaming about going into space and all those sorts of things. Like, how do we stay, you know, how do we, how can we evolve the culture, right? And that's one of the things we try to tell the youth that we work with and remind ourselves is that, you know, we're responsible for the stories that our grandchildren are going to tell, right? Both in the sense of carrying forward the stories, the old stories, you know, but they're going to be telling stories about some of the stuff that we did, right? Or, and they're going to be retelling the stories that we start telling now, right? That we just, we, we dreamed up right now and talking about the artwork that's being created now. And that's going to go on down through the generations. And that how do you take responsibility to be part of that flow of, of tradition, as opposed to sort of thinking, you know, tradition is just something that happened in the past, right? And we're just kind of carrying it forward. We're certainly doing that, but there's a huge chunk of it. Like we say to the kids, we're like somebody, that story that, you know, this story in the, in the opening storytelling thing that we, that, that was just told to you, that's, you know, at least seven, eight, nine, maybe 10 generations old, right? That started with somebody sitting down and telling a story. And then the community or somebody thinking that it was a good enough story to tell it again, right? And then again and again and again. And that's how stories start is they start with somebody sitting down and telling the story, making the artwork. And so how do we encourage them to be, you know, really fully embrace that and take part of that so that they, you know, they become the ancestors, you know, that, uh, that, they, that they wanted, so. Thank you, Jason. Um, I'm always thinking this project has, I mean, it's so much about time. It's uh, about the, about something beginning in the sense of Saga Han and then Abadakwane continuous, the continuing fire. Um, one of the great things when we think about futures is that this project is going to continue. There's, you know, we've already started imagining uh, the next Abadakwane. Um, but, uh, but at the same time, we are kind of ruled in, in uh, settings like these uh, by time. <laughs> and we're getting, we're, we're getting uh, to, the, to the very end. I don't know, I'm gonna hand it over to Christine in case you wanted to wrap it up before we go to questions or anything, no? I think let's go to the questions and hear what others had to speak and say. Hi everybody, I'm back. Uh, well, we we are going to go over time a little bit, but that's okay. Um, we've got we've had some really great questions. Um, can all of the participants see the questions? Um, the very first one was submitted before the event even started by um, a partner of the galleries on this exhibition, Byungis Mahasan, who is also a co-author. Um, uh, wrote a piece in the catalog. Um, I don't know, do, do, do Greg or Christine, do you, one of you want to read the question out and then, and then unpack it a little bit? We, we may not have time to get to all of the questions. Some of them are a bit long. I mean, they're, they're, they're great questions, but uh, with the time that we've got, we'll see how much we can do. Is that okay? I, I can't see uh, Young's question now, but I did read it earlier. Um, and uh, if I can just pull a piece of it out um there's a bunch Greg, of if you reasons. like i can I'll, I'll read it out to you if you want sure okay so byung asks a, yeah it's it's <laughs> the first thing you might do to help us is to dense. is to restate it in maybe slightly simpler terms but here here it is um how is the concept of curating togetherness used to negotiate a transcultural and trans contextual dialogue of performative power and knowledge linked to specific counter narratives of indigenous curatorial practice in Abadakwane and beyond? I'll, I'll take a good question, out. Young. <laughs> um, just in that, uh, I think uh, Byung is asking from his own practice in a sense, uh, what he does and, 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 and what I'm seeing in his participation in Abadakwane, um, how he uh, accompanied an artist, Elang Luluang, and played a very active role in the installation and the negotiation with the institution. And 
Um, and then also with uh, the three of us as, as co-curators, Rochelle and Christine and I. Um, and and there's, there's, a, there's a lot of negotiating spaces and there's a lot of care uh, with the artists and there's a lot of thinking about um, the broader picture from uh, of other artists working in Taiwan, indigenous artists working in Taiwan and bringing everyone together. Um, so, I mean, I guess I kind of, that's what I think of when I, when, when, when you're reading that question. Um, I don't know if others have any, any other thoughts. I just wanted to add um, uh, something that it, it, it wasn't a, a big program. It was a really small program that we did with Elaine and um, uh, the beautiful weaving that she did the piece at, right at the beginning of Abadakwane. Um, and what we did was she wanted to work with indigenous children. So we brought in children, the community and they went inside her piece and like we we're not allowed to do that anymore <laughs> but for that for that one you know half an hour whatever it was little indigenous kids who um you know were so used to, to that idea of removal when it comes to our children and sometimes an unsettling of um where they are because they don't have that connection necessarily so when we had that very small interaction with um, Elaine inside, um, it was like all these little kids were being hugged by her art and they had a space and they belonged there and they had fun and they had joy and they can talk to the artist. And I just wanted to say that from an educational perspective and community perspective, that was just like that idea of togetherness on a micro level was really beautiful and, and needed. Thanks guys. Um, the next question uh, comes, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sort of cut to the chase a little bit. The person is asking, first of all, the person says that they've really loved the um, large scale artworks that were in the colonnade area of the gallery. The one that was there hanging from the colonnade ceiling um, during Sagahan and the one that went up the, the ramp of the colonnade for Abedakwane by Joy T. Arkand. And so the person's question is to the curators, is there any talk of acquiring those works and making them part of the collection? I think I know the answer to one of them, but you can go ahead. Why? Um, done on both <laughs> counts. Yeah. Uh, That's kind of what I thought. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a it's a really exciting part of of these exhibitions is that we work really hard to acquire uh, many many of the works in the exhibitions. So I'm uh, happy to say that uh, both Shubhani Shuna John Staden's piece from Saga Han and uh, and Joy Arcan's work are are part of the collection, permanent part. Great, thank you. The next part of this person's question is uh, also for the curators. They're, they're hopeful that um, space can be made even uh, on the second floor in the European galleries. If we took down some European art, they're saying we could make some room for some more indigenous art. I'll let you guys handle that one. <laughs> Shall I? Uh, good idea. <laughs> yeah, I don't think our curator of uh, European um, art would agree. <laughs> Why don't, why don't we just think of a new wing? <laughs> uh, yeah. Let's think of uh, how we can extend the rafters. <laughs> Good idea. Next is a question specifically for Guai. The person says, um, I love the idea of transforming technology and that technology can be a transformative tool. Um, have you thought of transforming a drone into a raven, for example? Uh, well, well, not specifically uh, a drone into a raven, but uh, we've been working on acquiring a drone for all of our uh, fun activities. Um, I, I also um, just wanted to throw out to uh, Greg, Christine, and and everybody just um, a celebration of Abadakwane. Um, you know, feel like um, we get um, 
you know, native art can be kind of uh, ghettoized and like wind up on the second stage. And this particular show was, was an amazing elevation. The, the curation was great. You know, I, I went through and, and, and really just felt like um, all the, all the represented artists, you know, deserved to be celebrated in this, in this place. And, and it's a, and it's a great um, elevation. Thank you, Guai. Um, next. Oh, this is a question for Dempsey. The person is asking, who are you referring to when you talk about Frida? Um, I'm talking about Frida Deesing. She's, uh, she's Haida. She's my first teacher. And she's, she was a great artist. And not only a great artist, she was a great teacher. Because like when I started in 68, um, she was the only person teaching here. We had some old carvers, but they weren't teaching. And so, you know, we didn't, we almost lost it. She, our art was hanging on by a thread and it was Frida. And, you know, people always talk about the revival of the Northwest Coast. It was those teachers that revived it, kept it going. Because what, how art grows is art schools, teaching doing the work and that's what Frida taught us you know she she showed us how to get information on our, our nations on our tribes on our clans on our histories where to find the the books and she gave us tools and knowledge and like you know like like she sends me to Alaska and um you know, one day she kicked me out of the nest and she said that uh, she can't take me any further. She said, if I want to go, I got to go by myself. And that made me really mad because she kept, well, it really pissed me off because she kept teaching Don Yeomans and I was competing against Don Yeomans. <laughs> Anyways, I went to Alaska and we taught up there and we had to carve a mask. I had to carve a mask in one day just to be able to teach. And Frida sent me up there. Anyways, Phil Genzi, he's a great silversmith. He phoned me and he said, you know what? He said, we carve for, we, we actually taught for nothing. I said, what do you mean? We got paid, we got wages to teach. But he said that we had to give them mask, we gave them spoons, we gave them boxes, we gave them bowls, just to be able to teach our own people. And he said, you know what? He said, uh, we did it because Frida said to do it. And then he said, um, we did it for the love of Frida, he said. <laughs> because he said, those pieces are worth more than we ever got paid for now. He said that our art got known those pieces are worth thousands of dollars, he said. And, you know, and we had to give them because just to be able to teach our own people. But I realize now what Frida did was, she was smart because it made me do my homework, my own nation, my own people, my own art. And I realized that's what I had to do. I had to go. And I think where the art's gonna go it's going to be different, but I think it has art has to come from a foundation. Art has to come from its own history, your history, to make it real. Because culture is what makes life real. You know, because if you do not believe in your culture and you do not live it, everything is meaningless. And that's what's happening to the young people because culture is what grounds you and gives you meaning in your life. And art is a big part of it. And that's what I've learned by just doing it. Hope I answered you. <laughs> Thank you, Dempsey. Yeah, I think you did. Um, 
it's it's 11 minutes after two now in Ottawa. I, I think we're going to have to call it there. Um, Christine or Greg, would one of you like to say a, a final word? Um, be, before I transfer it over to you, you might be re uh, preparing to say this, but I want to mention to anybody watching that stay tuned. That, so the Abed Akwene exhibition is now closed, um, but these online chats, we're planning to continue them. We might call it something slightly different, we'll see in indigenous art chats or something like that. But uh, we do have plans to to pursue this project and, and, and stay tuned on the National Gallery of Canada's website. You will, when the time comes, you'll see uh, when the next one is gonna be ready. We're, we're hoping to keep going with these. But maybe, maybe Christine, a, you wanna say something. Or maybe a reminder of where to get the catalog. Yeah, there, yes. yeah, there it is, yeah. Oh, go, the catalog is at- I don't have uh, it yet. I need to get it. <laughs> go on, so gallery.ca. In French, it's beauxarts.ca. And uh, get to the boutique, follow whatever links are on the gallery's website to get to the boutique, and then you will be able to purchase the catalog online. They've got it for you now. Christine, Greg, anybody? Uh, no, not, well, okay. I uh, <laughs> guess I am saying something. Thank you. Thank you all and you all uh, very much for everything you've done, for being the amazing people that you are. Um, that's all the people at the gallery and all the artists and all of our contributors to the catalog and our advisors. Um, tons of hard work have gone into this and will continue because we are doing Abed Akwene again and again. Um, and, uh, and I'm so looking forward. Thank you. Oh, well. thank, thank you, everybody. You. And thank, it's you. Th th thank you, Dempsey. Thank you, Guai, Carla, Jason, thank and you. Jamie, Greg, and Christine, and all the people behind the scenes. Um, we're going to sign off, but we will see you again next time. Thank you, everybody. Okay, Bye. everyone. Bye. Thank you so Bye. much. Bye. See you next time. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>